Hey, Katie. Hey, Sarah. It's great to meet up with you here on Mozart Snapshots. Thanks. It's great to see you, as always. So where are we visiting today? Today, we are going to visit one of the oldest, largest, and best preserved medieval castles in all of Europe, the Festung Hohen in Salzburg. When was it built? Construction began way back in 1077, and so this festum is not only unique because of that, but also because it has the oldest cable railway still in use today, and, particularly interesting for us, it has the oldest functioning mechanical organ in the world. Really cool. Actually, I came up with the railway, but it seemed rather new than old. That's right, because you came up with the Festungs bond, and that one dates actually from the 1800s. But the old one is on the other side of the Festung, and it was built between 1495 and 1504, and it is used, as it always has been, to carry goods up to the castle. Well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the organ. Well, the organ is called the Salzburg Stier. Stier is the German word for bull, so it is literally the Salzburg bull. Because of, of the sounds it makes? No, because of the legend of the Salzburg Stierwasher. What is that? In 1525, there was a German peasant revolt, and the town of Salzburg was under attack. And the enemy actually wanted to starve the people of Salzburg until they surrendered. And unfortunately for the Salzburgers, it was a rather desperate situation because they had very little food left, and even worse, they only had one single bull. But the commander of the city had a novel idea. What was that? Well, he gave the order to have this single bull that they had painted white and then put out on the bastion in front of the festum wall. And then on the next day, he ordered the same thing except painted black, and then on the next day to be painted red, and then on the next day to be painted spotted, and you get the idea. The purpose was to show the enemy that the people of Salzburg had so many bulls and cows and livestock that they could actually last for really a long time. And so consequently, the enemy went away, and the people of Salzburg were free, and they took this poor bull down and washed him in the river so that he could return to his normal brown color. And so ever since that moment, the people from Salzburg are known as Stierwasher, or bull washers. What a wonderful story! And so that means that Mozart was a Stierwasher? He was indeed. To get back to the Salzburg organ, I guess Mozart has a connection to it. He does, but actually not the Mozart you're thinking of, not Wolfgang, but rather his father, Leopold. So here is the Salzburg steer. Let's go in and have a look. Wow. This is interesting. It has lots of pipes, but no keyboard. That's right. That's because it's a mechanical organ or a barrel organ, and the actual playing mechanism is this rather than a keyboard like on a normal organ. Oh, I see. So when was the organ constructed and when does it play? Well, the original Salzburg steer is only this part. Okay, so these large pipes and the small pipes in front. And this actually dates from 1502. And you hear this every day at 4 a.m. and 7 p.m. playing a very, very loud F major chord. And the reason for that is because back in the Middle Ages, this was kind of like an alarm clock for the people of Salzburg. So at 4 o'clock in the morning, it meant it was time for them to get up. And at 7 p.m., it was time to get ready to go to bed. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And then in the middle of the 1600s, this part was added to it. And this barrel mechanism allowed it to be able to play 12 pieces of music. And when it was renovated in the middle of the 1700s, the uh, court uh, organ rebuilder asked Leopold Mozart if he would compose a set of pieces for this Salzburg Stier. And so the resulting pieces, Der Morgen und der Abend, which means morning and evening, and actually the music was so well received that Leopold then published it as a set of pieces for keyboard in Augsburg in 1759. Kitty, I can't wait to hear it. Shall we listen then? I would love to. Okay, so I'm going to push start, and you are going to hear this very, very loud F major chord, followed by a piece of music by Leopold, and this is called Fur den Weinmonat. So, here we go.
Mozart as being this rather tyrannical father who accomplished little himself. Yeah, you know, I think history has been rather unfair to Leopold, though, because actually he was quite a successful man in his own right. You know, he was a very well-respected composer. He was very educated. He had graduated even magna cum laude. He could speak four languages. He had a profound knowledge of literature and politics. He had a great sense of humor. And he mixed really well with the aristocracy. And above all, he was an absolutely first-rate pedagogue. What instrument did he teach? He taught both the keyboard and the violin, but he himself was a violinist, and he wrote a treatise on violin playing, which was called Der Versuch einer Grundlichen Violinschule, and this was actually the most important violin tutor of its day, and it's even used today as a major authority on historical performance practice. He taught both Wolfgang and Nannerl, didn't he? He did, and he was not only their music teacher, but he was responsible for their complete general education. Was he strict with Wolfgang? Yes, he was, because he wanted to make sure that Wolfgang got a very thorough education, but at the same time, he gave him a lot of freedom, and he kind of allowed Wolfgang to learn by a system of trial and error. And this was wonderful. It gave free reign to Wolfgang's already very vivid imagination. And so, in a way, I think, Life and learning was one big game for Wolfgang. <laughs> By the way, this room is really unique. What is it called? This is the Forstenzimmer. There is a set of three rooms, um, and these rooms are the prince's rooms. This particular one is called the Golden Stube. The ceiling reminds me of starry night stars. That's right, and it's supposed to do exactly that. Because of all this beautiful lapis blue, this is the night sky. <laughs> I can really see it, but to get back to Mozart, um, what was he also Stiervascher, Leopold? No, Leopold was not a Stiervascher because he was born about 100 miles away in the town of Augsburg, which is in present-day Bavaria. So what brought him to Salzburg? He came to Salzburg as an 18-year-old, uh, enrolled in the Benedictine University to study philosophy and jurisprudence. However, in just under two years, he was actually kicked out of the university for never attending classes. And so it's pretty clear that by that time, he had made his decision to become a musician. And did his family support the desire to become a musician? Well, actually, his family wanted him to become a priest. And Leopold kind of hoodwinked everybody into thinking that he was going to do that too. But um, it was pretty clearly not the life for him. And so actually, as soon as he had come to Salzburg, he began um, publishing his first compositions, he took students, and he got a position as a violinist in the court orchestra. It sounds like he was a little bit rebellious, just like his son. Oh, he was definitely rebellious, and you know how the saying goes, like father, like son. And what's funny is that just like Wolfgang, he married without the permission of his family. And uh, you know, this was quite uh, unique. I mean, he was quite rebellious. You know, and, but the interesting thing is that both uh, Wolfgang and Leopold had very happy marriages, so quite obviously they made the right decision, even if it wasn't with their family's approval. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. But so did he remain in the service of the Archbishop? Yes, he did. He became court composer and later vice Kapellmeister, and he probably would have been promoted to Kapellmeister, except that when he was away so often, uh, you know, traveling with Wolfgang, he really he missed out on opportunities to become promoted. So. He gave up really a lot from Wolfgang's career, didn't he? Oh, he gave up everything, actually. And, you know, we always think of him as being this cold, calculating father who saw his children as a way to make a fortune for the family. But, you know, he really did build Wolfgang's career. I mean, he did everything. He wrote the letters of recommendation. He made the connection to the other musicians to organize concerts. He planned the, tra the travels. He planned the carriages. He planned the routes. He made sure that the music was, that the scores showed up for the performances. I mean, he really did everything. So actually, you know, Wolfgang owed him quite a lot. <laughs> In a way, Wolfgang was lucky to have had such a father. 
That's right. And he had a very complicated relationship with his father. You know, he loved him. He feared him. He idolized him. He felt suffocated by him. And eventually he rebelled from him. But I think that very probably without the driving ambition of Leopold, the world may very well never have known the true potential of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I think so too. Well, thank you as always. And thank you for showing me this breathtaking view. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Bis zum nächsten Mal.